what's right and what's wrong with the medical delivery system. The four panelists will be speaking to this question this afternoon. I'll recognize them at the point of the judges as they have requested on this particular topic. I'd like to just briefly introduce these four individuals now, and then before each of them speak, I'll give a further introduction. Over here on my screen right, your left, is first Dr. Richard McGraw, who comes to us from Norfolk, Virginia, and is the president of the Eastern Virginia Medical Authority. Next to him on my right is Mr. John Ross, who is from Des Moines and is the executive director of the Iowa Health Systems Agency. On my left, first here, is Dr. L.W. Swanson, who is from Mason City and is president of the Iowa Medical Society and is also engaged in private practice in Mason City. And last on my left here is Mr. Charles R. Linden, who is the administrator of the Boone County Hospital. The format we're going to be using this afternoon is as follows. Uh, we'd like each of the panel members, in the order that they appear in the program and that I just briefly introduced them, to make a presentation on the topic before us. These will vary some in terms of the length of time they'll be, but they'll all be fairly short. Then after uh, all four panelists have presented their initial views, we will then probably take a very short break uh, to give you a chance to move around to get something to drink. After that, we hope everyone comes back. Uh, after the break, we will first give each of the four panelists an opportunity uh, to make any rebuttal that they would like to what their fellow panelists uh, have spoken to. And then after that, we'll take questions from the floor. All right, our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Richard McGraw. Uh, he, after receiving his MD degree in 1944 from the University of Minnesota, uh, he spent several years in private practice. From 1950 until 1969, he was a faculty member in the departments of psychiatry and neurology and internal medicine at the University of Minnesota. For one year, while he was on leave from the University of Minnesota in 1968 and 69, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health Manpower with the Department of HEW. From 1969 to 1973, he was Deputy Executive Dean and Professor of Internal Medicine and Psychiatry at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Since 1973, he has held his current position as President of the Eastern Virginia Medical Authority, which as I understand it, is a, is a regional public agency. Throughout his career, Dr. McGraw has published numerous articles on various topics in his field. The quality of his publications is evidenced by his receipt in 1966 of an award given by the National Association of Blue Shield Plans for Most Distinguished Writing in Medical Care and Medical Economics. Dr. McGraw. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm under the spell of uh, the Midwest and uh, of uh, this university. Uh, being on this campus reminds me of the enormous uh, goodwill which uh, the citizenry of this country, and uh, I think there's nowhere better exemplified than in the Midwest, have poured out uh, on their children and uh, on their own future uh, through these, uh, through these uh, most impressive uh, institutions that state the land grant policy. I, uh, I'm not only under the spell of, uh, of the university, but also uh, of uh, your superb clinic here in, in the uh, McFarland Clinic, which is not a, it's not a commercial or a I'm speaking rather of that clinic as, a, uh, as an example of the kind of uh, medical collectivity which uh, came uh, into being in the Midwest and uh, which characterizes uh, Midwestern medicine uh, more than any other part of the country. <clears throat> On the eastern seaboard, there are very, very few such uh, multi-specialty group practices. And, uh, in consequence, the organization of uh, health services is uh, much more disheveled and anarchic. And uh, and uh, I'm, I'm using some rather pejorative terms, and I, I really don't mean that uh, as it, quite as it's coming out. But it, it's much uh, much less attuned to current needs. And that gets me into what I want to say today um, a little bit prematurely. But let me make the point, and I'll come back to it. No, it, it, we're, we're asked to address the topic of um, what's right and what's wrong, and I think all of the panelists found that to be a somewhat polarized uh, 
uh, presentation. It isn't that we're avoiding controversy, but the, the, the reality is, is, um, is much more complex than that. And I think we want to think in terms of what's more satisfactory and what's less satisfactory about our system of health services. Uh, I boggle on the term delivery system because that, uh, that moves us into a sort of a commodity frame of reference and with, uh, due, uh, with due apology to our economist uh, moderator, I, I feel that we, we can't help ourselves through this uh, complex kind of thinking by misusing our basic ideas and terms. And, and we're dealing with a service here and not a commodity and, and delivery is not a very appropriate uh, uh, metaphor. Anyway, uh, in the, it makes some difference whether we consider what's right and what's wrong or what's more or less satisfactory as to whether we think of this uh, a system of services in uh, personal or uh, individual terms or in social terms. And uh, not the least of the problems that we have in front of us is that in my lifetime in the practice of medicine, uh, what used to be a rather simple two-party transaction uh, has uh, now changed, both because of changing technology and because of changing uh, modes of payment, so that uh, if any of you go to see a doctor or go to the hospital, your care uh, becomes something which transcends uh, your own interest. It actually becomes of interest, and, and your own family's interest. It becomes of interest to your uh, fellow uh, subscribers to Blue Cross and Blue Shield, to your fellow citizens, since they pay for, uh, through Gil Burton and other means, for the, the care that you're getting indirectly to your taxpayer, to the fellow taxpayers, it is no longer the kind of private two-party arrangement. And let's keep in mind that the, the slang term for the insurers is third-party payers, and that third party refers really uh, by indirection to the basic <coughs> transaction of the two-party process. I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, I was asked to lead off in this, and it's kind of tempting to make a catalog of what I think is better or not so good about arrangements. And I, indeed, when I got to working on this uh, presentation, that's the way I started, to make a simple catalog. And I'm going to say some of those things, but uh, let me say that that simple catalog will be, I think, of less use to us this afternoon or to the citizenry of Iowa as it uh, considers these issues, then it will be to establish rather a conceptual framework about what the delivery system, and, and please, I have a hard time with that word, I want to choke on it, what the system of health services um, is actually like. There is a Swiss historian uh, who uh, about uh, 50 years ago uh, coined an epigram and said that uh, the denial of complexity is the essence of tyranny. And we are in a situation uh, that I think exemplifies that very well. Uh, we are dealing with one of the most complex set of uh, institutions and arrangements in our society. And it behooves us to be very precise and uh, very uh, accurate in our analysis. Uh, you know, uh, Eric Severide, uh, a fellow Minnesotan, uh, uh, Mr. Linden, uh, has given his name to uh, a law that takes its place along with Parkinson's law, uh, and that is that uh, all problems come from solutions. And we in medicine and health are in precisely that situation because we're... Uh, we're a long way along now with a reformation, a restructuring, a reforming of our arrangements for health uh, services. Uh, we entered into a crescendo of change following World War II. During World War II, you know, um, uh, we had, because we had a freeze on um, increases in salaries and wages, uh, there was a widespread move in industry to uh, recruit by enhancing fringe benefits. And it was during that time that the uh, practice of uh, industries paying for 
uh, medical and health uh, services through uh, third-party reimbursement mechanisms came into flower. And had it not been for that accident of history, we would perhaps not have had trust upon us uh, that particular solution as rapidly as it came. It came during World War II with a consequence that immediately at the end of the war, we had another problem that came from that solution. And the problem was a shortage of hospital beds because we were now then paying for hospital care through third-party payers. So we immediately, and with the best will in the world, the most benevolent uh, intent in the world, we came up with another solution, which was to build hospital beds under Hill Burton. And uh, many of the problems that we'll hear about today uh, stem from that benevolent solution. I mean, that, that's, that's where some of our problems came from. Another thing we did was to invest enormous amounts of money, enormous amounts of money. For 25 years, there was a 25% increase annually in the amount of federal money going into research. We invested enormous amounts of money in discovering new things about health. Now, that, you might think, would be an unmixed blessing. But I think uh, social history tells us time and again that any culture can only assimilate change at a certain rate without kind of choking on the process of change. There are many, many civilizations, you know, that have come to grief as, uh, as more uh, advanced Western uh, cultures were sort of imposed on them, and, and the civilizations, in effect, fell apart and, and uh, have never been reconstituted. Well, in a way, that has happened to us in medicine. We, uh, doctors of my age, in a sense, are immigrants to a new culture. It isn't, it isn't recognizable now what it was when we were young. And, and not only are the doctors immigrants to this culture, but we all are. And we've got a rather massive kind of economic, <coughs> philosophical, technological indigestion that results from this. Please, I'm not arguing about um, stifling discovery or new knowledge. I'm simply analyzing where we're at. We, we, another solution we undertook when uh, given, uh, given uh, problems of access was to grant purchasing power in medical and health services to those persons that didn't have this. And this was done on a very wide scale and uh, with, uh, again, a partial solution. But uh, one of the problems we have uh, with these uh, changes in reimbursement mechanisms is that a, a central and essential function that used to take place between doctor and patient has now been abrogated, and that was the rationing function, the function of deciding, uh, you know, what is really worth it? What are the trade-offs of hospitalizing or taking an x-ray or uh, going one therapeutic route with <coughs> surgery or medication as opposed to another? Are you understanding me? Am I confusing with what I'm saying? The doctor, when I entered practice in 1943 and 44, many of my decisions, many of the decisions that the patient and I made together had to do with what x-rays cost, what hospitalization cost. And it's been many years since that was a major consideration in most of medicine. And that has, that has, uh, if you really want to uncover the, the, uh, the, the uh, issue of medical care and hospital costs, it's, it starts right there with that, with the abrogation, with the, with the uh, passing away of that, that process of, uh, of um, uh, rationing. Well, what I'm saying is that we are in a time of uh, transition. And I, what I would like to do, uh, what I would like to present to you primarily are sort of two approaches to uh, the nature of this system of health services and, and highlight where some of our uh, better and not so good um, adaptations or arrangements uh, uh, show up in this process. You know, um, uh, one way of thinking about medical care is to uh, talk in terms of, uh, or, or health services, is to talk in terms of, of whether the um, uh, care has to do with the maintenance of health, whether it has to do with the uh, um, diagnosis, if you will, the recognition and management of uh, illness or uh, conditions that are not illness, of, of abnormalities, 
that are latent and undeclared, or whether this sector, whether the uh, care has to do with the treatment, uh, recognition, and management of actual illness, of, of uh, symptomatic disease, whether it has to do with the care and rehabilitation of chronic illness and disability, or whether it has to do with the uh, custodial care and management of essentially irremediable uh, conditions. Now, almost everything we do in regard to health services can be put in one or another of those categories. There is perhaps one I should have started with, which is education, health education, advice to people either individually or en masse as to what they can do to maintain uh, uh, their uh, well-being or to establish and maintain their well-being. But almost everything that goes on can be put into one of those categories. Now, uh, it's in general true, however, that uh, the profession and the institutions do what they are paid for and things that are not they, they do differentially well or intensively uh, things that are, are uh, paid for uh, in general we pay we are much more concerned about actual illness than any other of those things i speak of and so we see a sort of a lopsided effort that goes toward actual declared illness, pain, symptomatic illness, and recognized disability, and custodial care of those things that are here remediable. We were talking uh, in the luncheon uh, before coming here among ourselves, and uh, uh, Dr. Shakeshaft uh, made the point that, uh, uh, quoting a recent uh, publication, that uh, about 80% of what doctors do or what the health system does is sort of useless because it's essentially locking the barn door after the horse is out. I mean, really, what, what good does it do to operate on uh, cancer of the lung when you have a five-year survival rate of uh, less than 10% and as compared, say, to uh, blocking out uh, those forces in society uh, that uh, promote or, or maintain a smoking. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what, you know, I mean, that, that really is futile. It's, it's like, uh, it's like uh, trying to uh, blot up the, uh, uh, a uh, spill from the washing machine with a single Kleenex. And, and uh, yet uh, an awful lot of what we do is, uh, is precisely that way. Nonetheless, that is what we as individuals who are suffering wish. It's a great mistake to make a immediate one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between medical care and health. We, we call, we speak of this as health services, and that's one of the ways in which we confuse ourselves. Medical care has much more to do with uh, what the philosophers call the anguish of living, existential anguish, and it has to do with uh, the actual health of the population. I think I, I'd just like to state that as a, as a uh, axiom, and we can argue about it uh, among ourselves subsequently. All right. In each, so what I'm saying is that if you think of those things, if you think of those categories that I speak of, most of what we're doing well <coughs> is in the declared illness part of it, and particularly the non-custodial part of it. Because the, uh, the warehousing of the elderly, the warehousing of the uh, uh, grossly disabled or retarded is not something that we're doing well. It's, uh, it is, however, perhaps uh, a little bit of a cop-out to declare that as a problem of the system of delivery, since it is, I believe, much more a problem of our mores as a society. Now, uh, the delivery system, so-called, really does not do a very good job of health education or health maintenance. But I think that the delivery system here is a pretty exact mirror of the motivations of individuals and the priorities of society. Now, 
uh, here again, let's not kid ourselves about how specific and how much benefit there is actually in prevention. Preventive medicine can easily become a kind of a, of a rhetorical device. Really, when things become truly preventable, they are applied very quickly and they almost move outside of the delivery system per se. One of the best examples I know is, uh, is uh, the prevention of uh, iodine deficient goiter by uh, inserting iodine in salt. It becomes, uh, it, it becomes a matter of legislation. And now this thing moves slowly sometimes, witness fluorine and water supplies, but nonetheless when things become truly preventable, they tend to be moved into the general machinery of, of uh, society. Now there's, again, there tends to be a long, lazy period while society kind of uh, comes up to speed and recognizes what's involved. And we're in that situation right now with regard to immunization. Uh, we have not really, um, we have not really decided as a, as a culture that we're ready to enforce immunizations in, in young people. Okay, let me move on to another way of thinking about the system of services. And um, uh, now I want to hearken back to the uh, two-party transaction that I spoke of earlier. I'm not sure, I didn't notice the time when we started. There's third no shortage. I think we started about about 20 minutes. I hope you heard that. Wow. I said, you can't have said much. I've only got one note. Um, well, I have to pull myself up by myself. I'm gonna, uh, all right, I'm going to make uh, a few more comments. Um, one way of thinking about uh, this system of uh, uh, health services is to harken back to a sense of time. Uh, and uh, <coughs> there was a time, and some of us who are still in medical practice can remember when this was true enough so that we could almost say that it was a whole of medicine. When this was in fact a two-party transaction, when there was a provider <coughs> over here, and there's no question that that provider was a doctor. And there was what we now call a consumer over here, and that person is a patient. I'm going to use the word consumer because it's more abstract. You remember patient or purchaser or payer, they all fit over here. Now, <coughs> this is a two-party transaction. Very important. It remains important. It remains central to the whole operation. Because among other things, this is a negotiation in which the person who is asking for help presents himself in a variety of ways in terms of what his problem is. And this person helps to define it. Now that is, that is not so much a matter of people coming to understand something in order to tell you, as it is a negotiation about value system. Negotiation about that. Do I want something? Do I want to undergo a thoracotomy? Or would I rather uh, have it like that? Do I want my best treatment? Uh, you know. mm -hmm. That whole that whole transaction is very complicated. It's right there that the human realities are separate and are foremost and helpless. However, again, in the time I've been in medicine, this has gotten infinitely more complicated. And what we are all about here <coughs> is rearranging this simple concept here. Now, it, was, it was always more complicated than I knew, but it's gotten really complicated. For example, what used to be something that the doctor did has now become something that uh, a team of people do. And I mean a team of people other than other doctors. I'll get to that in a moment. But there's an awful lot of doctors now coming. I was living in her case in Mexico. We have two nurses who are actually 
sitting on a fence on the other side of Mount Gerizim. And they go to all the churches everywhere. And they are, they are referred to right and left hand. And, and together they, they make the peace. And those people also have contracts with the church. Then there is the, his, his medical colleagues, the other doctors. When I was in Texas, one doctor stood in the middle of him very close enough so that he could represent the church in the whole time. And now, the other doctor is a chief of an church. And one of our problems is that except in places like the Midwest, where there are formal uh, group practices. Most of our country doesn't have any good model for putting country country back together in the medical country back together. And, and that's a great, that's a great problem for uh, in medical care. But interestingly enough, this medical country country code has now been recognized as law. And uh, <clears throat> it has been held that the hospital staffs, the hospital <coughs> staff have direct contractual responsibility for individual patients. And if this patient in a hospital is not well cared for, that patient can indeed sue this doctor, but can also sue those doctors for any dereliction that occurred. And I win, but that, that contract has and has been defined as contractual responsibility and is in there. Now, then there is the hospital. And that hospital also has, has again, very clearly defined our law, a contractual responsibility for this patient. Now, none of those contracts supersede this basic one. They are all complementary to it. They are all add-ons. Remember what Burkhardt said, the denial of complexity is the essence of spirit. And, and now we have, we see, an infinitely more complicated situation. And truth to tell, the situation is more complicated than that, and I'll come back to this provider side of the equation in a moment. Now let me go to the consumer side. Remember what I said already, payer side. We once had a situation in which a patient paid a doctor to do what had to be done. And now that's become extremely complicated by virtue of the arrangements for payers. And we, we had to do this because things are getting very expensive. We shared the cost, but now, believe me, if you go to a hospital and you have an open heart surgery or you have a kidney transplant, or you have, uh, you have, uh, you, you have a quadriplegic or a paraplegic in your family, and this gets taken care of. Believe me, that care becomes not merely an issue between the patient and the family and this set of individuals, but it becomes a concern to the other payers, to that uh, insurer, or the other, uh, the other citizens who are paying taxes and paying it that way. And what has happened, actually, is not only that this doctor has obligations to each of those sets. And he has those very clearly. has those obligations. He has to meet the obligations to the third party payers by the way he conducts his care of the patient, by whether or not the patient is discharged or at a certain time. And that's all that's, that's all very weighty, very much on the doctor's shoulders. He's got all these kinds of obligations. But at the level of the medical collective, the group practice, there are also a series of These do not have the force of law. They're not entirely understood. But it makes a great deal of difference to a community whether the doctors get themselves organized so that there is a formal way in which there is 24-hour coverage for all the people in the community, or whether the doctors in effect sign out in a kind of an anonymous way to the hospital emergency. There is a phrase called, there's a phrase, the collusion of anonymity that refers to the business of kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, slipping, uh, slipping uh, through the cracks of the system. I'm not talking about patients slipping through the cracks of the system. I'm talking about providers. 
taking refuge and signing out, and you know, if he is not there, the patient has got to lose somebody else. Now, here again, the Midwest, in comparison to other parts of the country, is really blessed. Not because every doctor is in that kind of organization, but because there is enough of that organization for people in the Well, we've got major problems there. <clears throat> one, of, one of the things wrong with uh, our medical care system has to do with hospital emergency rooms and how they're staffed and whether the doctors on the medical staff get themselves organized so that that care is provided or whether they manage to outfumble uh, the system and let, let the thing be picked up. I'm thinking longer than I had intended, Madam Chairman. I'm going to stop at this point and I'll talk more about specific problems. Okay. Right. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Our second uh, panelist for this afternoon is Mr. John Ross. And Mr. Ross served the United States Army for 20 years before uh, receiving his university education. His academic training includes a master's degree from Indiana University in 1965 with a major in counseling and guidance and a minor in management and personnel administration. He has also done postgraduate study in business administration and has had training in the field of health resource statistics. From 1965 to 1969, Mr. Ross was assistant director in the Office of Student Services at the University of Kentucky Medical Center uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. After that, he became associate director of the Bluegrass Regional Health Planning Council. Next, he, uh, from 1973 to 1976, he served as executive director of the Southwestern Michigan Comprehensive Health Planning Association, and since 1976, uh, he moved into his current position, which is Executive Director of the Iowa Health Systems Agency. Mr. Ross. Thank you, Gene. Given the old adage that nothing's perfect, I guess the question addressed to this panel as to what's right and what's wrong with the delivery system is adequately, <coughs> if not aptly put. As I approach the task of preparing my comments and answer to the question, I resolved to attempt to strike a balance between right and wrong as I find it existing in the Iowa health service area. With due apology, of course, uh, uh, to the gray areas that will mark your position where right stops and wrong begins and vice versa. <clears throat> I think though that during the past year and a half while my agency compiled its first health systems plan, I did hear, indeed hear much debate about the things that were right with the system and the things that were wrong with the system. Of course, much of the rightness and much of the wrongness was dependent upon the debater's perspective of the system. This comes about because our health care delivery system is so broad and diverse, and I might add the word complex, as Dr. McGraw has described to us. This health care system ranges from community health protection services, such as water and treatment and sewage treatment plants, prevention and detection services, such as our immunization program. The system also includes habilitation and rehabilitation services, maintenance services, and support services, such as clinical laboratories and blood banks. By far and away, the most widely used and most often discussed set of services within the system are those which we refer to as diagnosis and treatment. It is to this particular part of the system, then, that I would address the bulk of my remarks. The largest amount of diagnosis and treatment service is provided through the primary care physician. There are over a thousand primary care physicians in our service area, and this amounts to about one for every 2,400 individuals. Using a complex set of assumptions, our office currently estimates that 90% of the demand for primary care services is being met in the Iowa Health Service area. Unfortunately, we have 12 counties where less than 60% of the demand is met and 20 counties where 110% of the demand is met. It seems then that one of the things right with the system is that we meet a substantial amount of the demand for primary care physicians in our service area. What's wrong with the system is that we have an obvious maldistribution of primary care practitioners around the state. Another big provider of diagnosis and treatment services, of course, are the hospitals. Now, we have a representative of the Iowa Hospital Association on the panel, 
So I'll not dwell on the role of the general hospital in diagnosis and treatment. I would like to point out, however, that over 99% of our population is, is, is within 40 minutes travel time to a hospital. Now that's a right in our system showing ready availability. We also currently have 5.89 beds per 1,000 population in our health service area. And this is a huge excess, and that's not so right. Our agency staff maintains that 4.5 beds per thousand would maintain that ready, ready availability I referred to. And it's still time, have time to serve for constraining the cost of health care. Now we also have considerable specialty diagnosis and treatment capability in this health service area. For example, in the treatment of renal disease, we have eight dialysis centers located throughout our area, and three of the facilities serving our health service area perform kidney transplants. Thus, we have ample treatment facilities for those afflicted with renal disease. This gives us the appearance that these things then are all right with this part of the system. What's wrong with the system is that we do not have enough kidneys for transplantation. We currently have 60 citizens needing transplants and very few organs available to meet their needs. It's note noteworthy also that we have a substantial amount of cardiac catheter catheterization and surgical services available to us in this area. Only portions of five counties are more than 90 miles from catheterizations and only portions of 11 counties are further than 90 miles from cardiovascular surgical services. This indicates ready availability of the service, but here too, there's a maldistribution problem. While several counties have no service within 90 miles of the residence, some portions of Tama, Powashik, Lynn, and Benton County have six such services available to them. At this point, I'd like to move away from the technical aspects of our healthcare delivery system and report to you how I view our agency fitting into the development of and changes to that system. The charge to our agency under the federal law that created it is to improve the health status of the citizens of this health service area by modifying the healthcare delivery system that impacts on that status. Certain this means simply that our job is to try and find ways to make people better and do it through changes in their health care delivery system. Certainly the problems that I've outlined to you earlier are major problems for you and all of the people we serve. Several of your speakers yesterday made references to the health systems agency, and I thought I might give you just a glimpse of how we are approaching our mission. During the past year and a half, we have compiled our first health systems plan, which is a 336-page document. That I honestly hope will become familiar to each of you. This particular document, contrary to some popular beliefs, is not a statement of how to make change but outlines for you all specific and goals and objectives which, if achieved, would create a better health care delivery system. In other words, it's not a how-to-do-it plan, but rather a where-to-get-to plan. The responsibility for those achievements rests with both the consumer of health care services and the provider of those services. Now the consumer's role is to make reasonable choices and objective decisions in support of the plan that will encourage the providers to modify their own roles within the system. In order to help you, the general public, make these reasoned choices, the Health Systems Agency will provide a large and competent staff, a nonprofit organizational structure controlled by consumers and most importantly, an open process in its plan development. 
I'd like for you to know that during the past year, a non <coughs> excuse me, we involved over 400 volunteers with our agency. And that their draft document that I showed to you was taken to 11 separate communities in all parts of Iowa for public debate. I feel quite strongly that the openness of the process is the only manner in which we can achieve proper decisions and perhaps avoid some future connotations of wrong solutions that Dr. McGraw referred to. Many of the problems that confront our system today were brought about by the lack of coordination between the providers. Although I'm sure that each, in their own wisdom, over the years, thought they were moving towards the best interest of their communities, when their decisions were analyzed for the community of the whole of our area, we discover that many errors of omission as well as commission have taken place. Now, for the first time, the general public has an agency, which I wish them to consider as theirs, to bring about decisions in the future that will consider the community as a whole. There will, of course, be those that contend that our agency is not truly representative of the people or that the planning for an improved health care system should rest with the providers of health care rather than the consumers. In response to the first contention, I would simply point out that all of our staff and the volunteers who currently work with our education, or our agency, are dedicated to the open process I mentioned earlier. To gain wider awareness about our agency and its function, on Monday of this week, my board authorized an expenditure of $50,000 to be used to make the public more knowledgeable about our activity and to develop new forms for their participation. My contention is that the open process and awareness will produce an agency that is representative of the people. To respond to questions that may arise regarding the contention that providers can best plan the health care system for the people it serves, my personal position is that I accept the wisdom of the Congress of the United States, which passed Public Law 93-641 and appropriated monies to support the health systems agency network across the United States. And it was the Congress that vested the control of an agency in the consumers of health care services. Certainly, providers have been incorporated into our process to the widest degree possible. For each area of concern addressed in our health systems plan, we convened 16 separate technical task forces, and nearly 100% of these groups were comprised of providers. Our staff recognizes the technical expertise that the various professionals and their organization can provide the planning process. We have solicited their input on every occasion and have provided detailed analysis of their technical input to our board of directors and sub-area advisory councils so that appropriate decisions could be reached. Certainly there are many areas regarding our health care delivery system that we dis could discuss this afternoon and spend hours undertaking. However, I'd like to reserve as much time as possible for your questions and we'll close here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Another perspective on the, the question that we're looking at this afternoon uh, should be provided from our next uh, panelist. He is Dr. L.W. Swanson, and he is the current president of the Iowa Medical Society and is currently engaged in private practice in Mason City, Iowa. Dr. Swanson received his uh, MD degree from the University of Iowa in 1936. He interned at Albany Hospital in New York and completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Iowa where he subsequently did some teaching. Dr. Swanson has been very active in the Iowa Medical Society. He has been a member of numerous committees uh, during the past 19 years, and he has also served as one of the Iowa Medical Society's delegates to the AMA for 15 years. He became president of the Iowa Medical Society in May of 1977. Dr. Swanson. As she says, I'm a <coughs> practicing physician taking care of patients as late as 9.30 this morning. We physicians and hospitals have been criticized as a cottage industry, totally unorganized. As Dr. McGraw stated, 
we are not really an industry subject to the usual industrial economics. We are a service, a professional service, but nevertheless organized better than is often realized. With that in mind, I'd like to tell you something about what's right, in my view, with the Iowa, specifically Iowa, medical care delivery system. Iowans were pioneers in creating a health system for themselves without federal financing or dictation. They organized it on a statewide basis as needed and as it became feasible. As early as the turn of the century, boards of supervisors of each county were legally required to appoint overseers of the poor and contract with doctors uh, and hospitals for needed medical care, which was really a fine approach for including everyone in the medical system and uh, on an equal basis. For instance, uh, in our county, uh, to this day, no patient, no laboratory person knows whether the patient is a county patient or a state patient or a private patient. They all are treated exactly the same way. Contracts were set up in those early years with most county medical societies to provide such care, and also with the nearest hospital for hospital care, uh, either primary care or, or secondary medical care. <clears throat> As you know, not every county in Iowa has a hospital, so many times the adjoining county hospital was the subject of the contract uh, made by the Board of Supervisors. I assume you all understand what we're referring to when we say primary, secondary, and tertiary medical care. Is there any doubt about that. Primary care means your first approach. The primary care physician usually assumes charge of all of the patient's medical care and engineers it from there on as far as he can go with it. Secondary would be one level up. Tertiary would be the level of the care at the highly specialized center such as the University of Iowa Hospital. Tertiary care at the University of Iowa Hospital was initiated in this state about 1900. In 1915, the General Assembly passed the Perkins Act, recognizing state responsibility for specialized medical care for children who could not afford it otherwise. Children's Hospital at the University of Iowa was the first facility of the current West Side Health Science Campus. And it was in that hospital that some of you may remember, Dr. Steinler, the chief of orthopedics, performed orthopedic surgery on polio paralyzed patients children that made him and the University of Iowa first world famous. Uh, probably most of you now have never even seen a case of polio because this has gone by the board uh, via immunization and vaccination uh, as was referred to by Dr. McGraw. Thank goodness I can tell you that. In 1919, <clears throat> the haskell Klaus Act was passed by the state legislature and this extended centralized state care to adults, not just children. And each county was assigned an annual patient quota at the teaching hospital at Iowa City. Increasing demand for this service from all parts of the state led in 1924 to the funding with a matching grant from the Rockefeller Foundation for a 900 bed general hospital, which was completed in 1928 at Iowa City and is still a basic format of the much improved institution there. Transportation in those days was paid down to Iowa City from all parts of the state via bus or train tickets paid for by the county supervisors or the state. And this included an escort from the family <coughs> if the individual was too sick or too young to go alone. And this continued until the university hospital started its own statewide ambulance service in 1932, which still exists. I'm sure you've all seen University of Iowa hospitals, cars, which is an ambulance service all over the state. Since that time, <coughs> tertiary medical care capabilities at the university have grown to their present worldwide leadership roles as specialized medical resources for care, medical care for patients, also for teaching, because this is the state medical school, and for research, which as you know has been very active and very ably financed by the federal government in the last 20 years in particular. In addition, <coughs> Hilburton funds, previously referred to, 
have helped provide some small primary care hospitals throughout the state. Not all of the smaller hospitals are Hilburton hospitals, but a good many of them are. Good relationships and good referral patterns exist between the doctor's offices, primary care smaller hospitals, secondary care hospitals, which are usually those in the 100 to 400 bed capacity range, and the tertiary center at Iowa City. The relationships and referral patterns back and forth are excellent and always have been. The university uh, staff at the university hospital tries its best to uh, improve that relationship uh, regularly. In addition, in Iowa, county and regional public health nurses are pretty generally provided, also by law. They're managed usually by the State Department of Health, they're paid for by the local level and stationed at the local level. They function pretty efficiently, pretty well. They're, they're not completely as uh, physician's assistants, however, or independent nurse practitioners that you've heard about, but they could uh, fit into that category uh, if we chose to go that direction. Older retiring physicians in many of the small towns are not being replaced in recent years, as you know, particularly in the last two decades. Younger doctors and their wives, don't forget that part, prefer a broader-based practice and living area. To counterbalance that to a degree, the university developed, with the aid of the legislature and at the direction of the legislature, developed a physician's assistant program. Similarly, community hospital training programs for family practice residents, almost all except one affiliated with the university medical school, are evolving now, with two new ones in Waterloo and Sioux City being developed uh, this year, just getting started. One of these is in Mason City, which accounts for my interest uh, in the field of medical education on a local level. It is hoped <coughs> that many of these family practice resident physicians will locate in smaller towns, and so far a good proportion of the graduates of the program have done so. It's not uh, far enough along yet to be sure, but roughly 60% of them so far have stayed in smaller towns, that is below 10,000 population. Uh, uh, statistics of, uh, and studies of uh, why doctors are where they are indicate that they're inclined to stay within 50 or 100 miles of where they finish their final training. In other words, if the resident spends the last two years in, in uh, Ames, or, or I mean in Waterloo, or Sioux City, or Mason City, he's apt to stay in the general area because he's gotten acquainted with it, he knows the place, uh, the, the area knows him, his wife knows him, and uh, found it a good place to stay, and so a good many of them do. And this is the thesis upon which the family practice residencies throughout the community have been uh, developed on. Uh, a corollary of that, of course, is that <coughs> Dr. McGraw is working on currently in his present position. Uh, there aren't enough medical schools and medical school hospitals to train all these people at one time at one place. It has to be centralized or decentralized, uh, at the same time affiliated for the sake of quality with the medical school. And uh, so this is uh, developing in the state and so far looks to be producing good results. Meantime, <coughs> until we get more doctors or more sources of medical care in the smaller areas, Good transportation via cars or ambulances over excellent roads make medical care relatively easily accessible to all Iowans willing to ask for it. Mr. Ross has pointed out that no one is really very far from good medical care in the state of Iowa if he wants to seek it. However, <coughs> and this is a point that has not been raised <coughs> by either of the speakers, Iowans will not be regimented medically. And this you have to take into consideration. <coughs> I spoke a minute ago about the fact that doctors' wives won't be ready to live, much less the, <laughs> the patients in general. <coughs> and this is true. If they want medical care for even minor illnesses or worries, at a secondary center, instead of a primary center, they demand it and they go get it. If they want to go through a clinic as a status symbol or to satisfy themselves on the basis of reassurance, they demand it and they get it. In North Iowa, for instance, for many years, you know, it was very fashionable for people to go through the clinic at a Mayo Clinic in southern Minnesota. 
which is an excellent institution. But <clears throat> the point I'm making is that you cannot devise a system and force people to go to it. They, they want to go to it, they have to go to it, and the, and the uh, fields of education that Dr. McGraw mentioned uh, don't come easy. <laughs> they are uh, uh, efforts that have to be made over long periods of time by the patients involved. And of course, all this complicates what the HSA is attempting to do in achieving its goal, because uh, we can work out a fine plan on paper, but if the patient pays no attention to it, then we haven't made very much progress. Now, these public demands that I mentioned have increased the burden of doctors so much that some patients have been referred to hospital emergency rooms all over the state. Dr. McGraw mentioned this too, as a change in the pattern of medical care. Uh, a new class of doctor then, <coughs> the emergency room doctor, has appeared who works only in the emergency room. He, he works nowhere else. He has no privileges to practice medicine except in the emergency room because this is what he wants to do and this is the need that he fills. Now, why, why is this the case? Uh, some of it, uh, I'm sure, is uh, what Dr. McGraw referred to as the doctor beating the system. And uh, I'm sure we've all been guilty of that, <coughs> uh, particularly in some instances. Uh, uh, notably, well, in our hospital, for instance, uh, until July 1st of this year, all of us took turns being on call for the emergency room at night and weekends. We averaged about one week out of the year. There were about 60 or 70 doctors on our staff, and about 50 of them participated in the program. Uh, no one of us ever objected <coughs> to getting out of bed and going seeing someone in the emergency room in the middle of the night or 4 o'clock in the morning when he is truly sick. But if he's a transient going through, or he's had a cold for a week, or he's a waitress coming home from a nightclub at 2.30 in the morning and decides that she ought to have a checkup as to why she's been tired for the last two weeks, this does create a little bit of a, of a strain on the practicing physician who has to lose his sleep and then work all the next day just as though he had slept all night. So this kind of a burden has caused some rebellion on the part of practicing physicians, uh, sometimes of necessity, because uh, I used to be able to work all night and all the next day and not think anything of it, but I have to confess now, I get a little tired when I do that, particularly if it's two nights in a row, as happens on the weekends occasionally. So the emergency room physician is developed. He goes and works only in the emergency room. <clears throat> he develops uh, the care there for the patient, and if it's something that he can take care of for the moment, start them on treatment and refer them to someone else for continuing care afterward, fine. If he can't, if he thinks they're too sick, they need to be admitted to the hospital, then he has a list of those who will come and take care of that patient after he's been worked up and it has been determined that he's sick enough that he needs to be in the hospital. And really, this system is working out quite well so far in our area. I, I'm pleased with it. I'm, I'm, I know I'm getting more sleep than I did under the old system before the 1st of July, and most of the doctors in our area appreciate it very much. So the emergency room doctor really filled the need especially for the individual who seeks immediate care or night on, at night or on weekends at his own convenience for what may be a relatively trivial illness. Another thing that we have in Iowa that is uh, notable, I think, is that private city, county, and hospital, and volunteer ambulance services are available throughout the street, state. They're pretty generally available. And they will help the patient get into the system if he doesn't know how to get there any other way. One of the, one of the things we hear that is critical of the system is that the patient doesn't know how to get in. Well, now there are two ways that he can get in almost every area in Iowa. He can go to the emergency room, he's in when he gets there. Or he can call an ambulance and he's in when the ambulance gets there. So there really isn't any excuse, in my opinion, for a patient not knowing how to get into the medical system if he's really sick and needs emergency care. In short then, I think Iowa has a pretty good medical care delivery system. I would like to specify that I'm talking about medical care rather than health care, because as Dr. McGraw indicated, health care includes a whole lot of things like where you eat, what you eat, where you live, how you live, 
and so on, your economics as well as your state of happiness and what you do to abuse or disabuse yourself. But from the standpoint of delivery of medical care, uh, I think the doctors in Iowa have worked out a pretty good medical care system and we're constantly working to improve it with the aid of the State Medical Society and the University of Iowa Medical School. Our last panelist should be able to represent another point of view on these issues of medical delivery systems. Mr. Charles R. Linden uh, is a hospital administrator. He's the administrator of the Boone County Hospital, a uh, position that he's held now for 11 years. This, Mr. Linden received a bachelor's degree in public administration from the University of Minnesota in 1956 and a master's degree in hospital administration from the University of Iowa in 1958. He served in administration and residency in the VA hospital uh, in Iowa City and worked at St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids. In addition to his current position as administrator of the Boone County Hospital, he is also currently on the board of directors of the Iowa Foundation for Medical Care and is chairman of the board of the Iowa Hospital Mutual Insurance Corporation. He is the past president of the Iowa Hospital Association and has also been a past member of the Governor's Medical Emergency Service Advisory Council. Mr. Lane. Thank you. I used to think we had one heck of a delivery system until I saw in the paper that they delivered six of them within a minute and 20 seconds in Denmark, and that's got to be a record. <laughs> if you saw that in the paper, it was a squib of about that long. At the same time in the paper, that was in the paper. <coughs> Center page, full page ad, with the words pleasure, satisfying, enjoyable, magnificent. And in the bottom is a little corner thing that says warning. The Surgeon General has determined that cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. That's really what we're talking about is priorities. Priorities, what's right or wrong, and this is an American and a public decision we gotta make. Now as I looked at the task we had, that said what's right and what's wrong with the delivery system, and I went at it in a very simplistic way. I thought, well, I'll list 10 things that are right, and I'll list 10 things that are wrong, and I've done my job. Well, it isn't that simple as has been pointed out, because we're talking about a large, a costly, an emotional, a political, system that everybody is doing because everybody relates to it directly or indirectly sooner or later. However, I'm going to be simplistic for a few minutes and try to list some things that I think are right and some things that I think are wrong. If you'll recognize that it's not black and white, but we're in a gray area. What's right? American medicine, American hospitals, American health care are, or the people involved, the best trained, provide the best care, provide the most comprehensive service and range of services, and are involved in more research and more continuing education than any nation in the world. We don't have to take a set back seat to anybody, and that's one thing I think that's right about it. The vast majority of men and women who are involved in the delivery system are concerned about their patients, are concerned about their research, and are concerned about the products that they manufacture or deliver. They are devoted to providing service when needed, and they have a desire to try to provide high quality service.